China is never going to attack Taiwan unless a very specific condition is going to become true. A few weeks ago I made a live stream where I explained all of this. It was more than two hours long because I was rambling and other stuff, so I thought you may be interested to see this in a video format, and I'm sure you really want to know why China will never attack Taiwan unless something happens. Enjoy! Good evening, good evening everyone, benvenuti, welcome to this live stream. And no, there were no cracks on the Fujian deck some time ago. Satellite photos showed what apparently seemed to be large cracks in, in the flight deck, and in reality they were liquids. And what I find very meaningful is that the news outlets were already distributed this news that the Fujian carrier was falling in, into pieces. There's nothing like that. We'll see later in the live stream what is happening to that carrier. Today, the, the, today's live stream is even more important. This is something that I care a lot. So please stay till the end because the scenario that we are going to slowly build and present is something really disquieting. And probably our future depends from that. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. Probably I hope that I'm wrong. Didn't let me sleep at, well at night for some time. Okay, ready? Everything is good. Let's go. So in this video, uh, we will start from discussing why China is building its carriers. It's something that we are actually used to and we are sort of giving for granted. If you start digging deep, there are probably some scenarios that are quite a little bit disquieting, as I said, and uh, but okay, let's stay with me. And uh, before starting, just a small thing, this video is sponsored by you. This could have been a long video, uh, with maybe could attract a sponsor, uh, but in this case it's all up to you. Thank you very much for all those who are supporting the channel. Please, if you can, if you can, if you can afford, please consider supporting the channel in the ways that are shown here. So, let's start from the Chinese geography. As you, this is basically a map that shows the world maritime traffic. And as you can see here in, from China, there is a lot of traffic going through and uh, the maritime traffic is extremely, extremely important uh, for, um, for China. China's communication, China's commerce through uh, the land frontier is just a fraction of what goes through the large uh, ports of the Chinese coast. And this is a screenshot from um, traffic, uh, maritimetraffic.com that is basically showing the amount of traffic that goes through the northern and southern Chinese sea. As you can see, there are three streams of traffic. One that goes through the American continent. The second one, um, which is very important, it goes through the Malacca Strait and goes through the South China Sea and uh, skims Vietnam and Cambodia. And then there's another interesting stream that goes toward Indonesia and goes even down toward Australia. These are three very important streams uh, of communications and commerce for uh, China. So, in case of conflict, obviously this traffic is going to be in danger and it is likely going to stop. In case of a long conflict problem, this will be um, an economical problem for China. Chinese economy is based on, well, is, used to be based on export and now is pivoting toward the internal market, but that's not the main problem. You can survive without exporting. It has economic effects, but you can survive. What you can't uh, survive, what is more problematic, is the imports, because there are some imports that you can replace and some other imports that you can't replace. And it is actually a spectrum, there is a different level of complexity, difficulty in replacing the imports. Some are impossible, some are relatively easy. But anyway, you see here in blue the countries that are actually on the other side of the Malacca Strait. 
And in case of conflict, the first three, United States, South Korea and Japan, and probably also Australia, are going to probably not be accessible anymore for imports. As you can see, China imports electrical and electronic equipment as the main, the main category of import. And that is something that with investments, with some effort, can be replaced. But after that, we have mineral fuel oils, distillation products, ores, slag, oil seed, uh, grain, seed, fruits, but also in down here at the bottom, pulp of wood, fibrous cellulosic material, plaster, lime, cement, construction materials, uh, and so on. So it's not a surprise that oil is one of the main imports for China, and it's the kind of import that you can't replace. The same are minerals, the ores. If you just don't have them or you don't have enough, you will be lucky in them. So let's have some examples. So we are obviously talking about commodities, so the imports that are difficult to replace are commodities, everything else with an adequate level of investment and with adequate measures can be replaced. The Chinese top commodity imports are obviously petroleum, iron ore, petroleum gas, soybeans, refined copper and coal. For example, if you go and look to the to crude oil, the main importer now is Russia, as you many of you will know. But also there is Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, Iraq, and so on. And these, the one in blue, are all the suppliers that are on the other side of the Malacca Strait. And the one in yellow are uh, the United States and Australia, where in case of a conflict, in case of hostilities, are going to become inaccessible anymore. And you also may think uh, that Brazil won't be that easily accessed. So it's definitely um, not an easy situation for China. And the situation for the iron ore, uh, which is very important to keep the <laughs> most of the uh, mechanical industries, uh, construction industry going, are not much different. The main supplier is Australia. There is Brazil, which is sort of a gray situation, but there is also South Africa, India, and then these are actually very, very small. So again, there is a good possibility that this kind of import is going to cease. Anyway, if we want to have a look at the food, because you can't just build with, or better, you can't build without eating. Uh, the main supplier is Brazil, which is again in a gray area. Then you have the USA, Argentina, uh, and the other is, is debatable. Canada will cease, but these are really small. The, the, the main the top two are going to be again influenced by the hostilities. So in case of a conflict, and particularly in case of protracted conflict, there is a large fraction of the Chinese commodity imports that won't be available anymore. Um, we may expect that everything is exchanged with Russia will keep being exchanged, but we may expect also to have other uh, connections with Central Asia and so on, but these are minor. China depends heavily from the sea for the imports of what is not available inside the country. So this is a key consideration for uh, uh, the Chinese ruling class, obviously. So the one drawn in red is basically the jugular vein of the Chinese economy. It's this connection that goes for this path, this route that goes from the uh, ports in the South China through the South China Sea, through the Malacca Strait, skims India, and goes to the Persian Gulf. Key elements in Chinese strategic thinking. This line and the mer merchantile traffic along this line is essential. So, in case of a conflict with the United States and the Western Alliance, then what are the reasonable Chinese priorities? Well, they are probably like this, in the sense the North China Sea, it is well important because it's an area where there is a concentration of forces, but it's definitely less important than the South China Sea. That's the area where China has been expansive, has um, 
uh, through the uh, proclamation of the Nine Dash Line that actually includes many of the islands and the atolls in that sea, whose sovereignty is contested. China claims them uh, as uh, Chinese territory on the basis of a very old map that has never been really discussed. But all the other countries around them have claims on the same territories, and this has been a source of friction. And in the South China Sea, there are also some Chinese military bases built on these small islands. And this is perfectly coherent with Chinese uh, strategic requirement of keeping the jugular artery open. The second element is the uh, Malacca Strait, in which is obviously controlled by Singapore, shared between Malaysia and Indonesia. And when you're just out of, of the strait into the Indian Ocean, there are the Andaman Islands, which are Indian. And uh, all the mercantile traffic, the oil traffic, goes through this area south of India. And uh, um, this is an, an area which is actually under uh, Indian control, could be con- easily uh, controlled by the Indians. And it's not random fact that the Maldives islands have recently been, say, convinced by the Chinese politics to move to the um, Chinese side. There used to be some maritime patrol aircraft based on the on these islands, and uh, now they have been asked to leave, and they're going to be probably by Chinese maritime patrol aircraft. This is obviously significant because it's sort of an intrusion in an area that is considered historically part of the Indian sphere of influence, but uh, it is uh, obviously that does not change the fact that the Indian Navy and the Indian Air Force can make this area completely unavailable. And the U.S. Navy, by the way, can also reach out. In the Indian Ocean, there is a base, um, there is sea later, we see there, is, there, are, there are some bases in this area too. Okay, so if this is the strategic imperative, maintain this, uh, this logistic line with the Middle East, then what is all the fuss about Taiwan? Well, Taiwan, as such, is a relic of the Chinese Civil War, ended in 1949. The Kuomintang and the Nationalist forces, actually, after being defeated by the Communist forces, they retreated on, on Taiwan, and, uh, yep, they remained. Chinese have never actually um, dislodged them from their position. So, do the mainland China, the People's Republic of China, uh, get along with the Republic of China. Uh, how are their relations? Well, actually, people can freely travel, can move capitals from between the two states. They can relocate while they speak the same language. And currently, there is a massive commercial exchange between Taiwan and uh, mainland China. So uh, apparently, as things are now, they get along very well. But then sometimes you see things like those uh, shown in this map, where the Chinese do live fire exercises all around the Isle of Taiwan. And this is what happened when Nancy Pelosi some time ago actually visited um, Taiwan. And this was kind of demonstration that the uh, PRC actually put together for give uh, her a warm welcome. So what is the problem, the root of the problem? So they both claim to be the legitimate government of China, of the whole of China. And quite curiously, while the mainland China has occupied the South China Sea, the the islands of the South China Sea, and have these territorial disputes we're mentioning before, Taiwan actually says the same. They internationally are saying that those islands are part of the Republic of Taiwan, and they have exactly the same friction with, on, on those islands with the other states in the area, um, which is sort of fun. Anyway, from the point of view of the Chinese Communist Party, Taiwan is still an open wound. It's uh, the civil war that was never completed. And Xi, Xi Jinping made it clear many times that the reunification of Taiwan is a long-term objective of China. Let's say it has become one of those uh, situations among states that are more a point of principle than a pragmatic requirement. Actually, in practice, I think that both of them know that the best solution would be to leave the things as they are. 
and just forget. However, the PRC can do that. And even some political parties inside Taiwan can't fathom in any way, shape or form our unification with mainland China if the mainland China remain communist. China has built a rhetoric around this Taiwan uh, situation and it is apparently ambiguous. Sometimes they say that the reunification will be peaceful and there's all the time in the world to do the reunification. Some other times it says we are preparing for war. So it is part of the political game, obviously, to cater to the necessities of the moment. But there is basically no doubt that the long-term strategy of China is the reunification with Taiwan, even though in practice is not that important. But why China is so focused on Taiwan is because, well, China... Their national perception is that they are now exiting what they call the century of humiliation. China has been a very important power and for most of the history of humanity. The last century where colonial powers sort of uh, exerted their some level of domination, some level of control on China that brought to a terrible uh, political instability, civil wars, uh, the Japanese invasion the, in the Second World War, the Civil War, and so on. So they they think that that period was a dark period in their national history. Three or four decades ago, they started what they call the great rejuvenation of the nation, which basically means, well, industrialize, improve economically, uh, improve the quality of life of the people uh, living in China. Start being, uh, again, uh, an important power uh, on the world stage. And what they're doing, which may be deemed up to a point aggressive, is exactly what any emerging power does. And mind, I am not giving any ethical judgment in here. Americans believe that they are ethically and morally on the right side. Chinese think that they are ethically and morally on the right side. And the same can be said in many, many other disputes that happen around the world. So there's no point going through an ethical analysis of what has happened, who is right, who is wrong. Please consider that the very definition of power, of great power, of emerging power, or even regional power, is a country that is messing with other countries. A country is not a power if it can't mess with any other country. Uh, but any country that exerts some form of influence on other countries, somewhat limiting the choices that these other countries have, is a power. And then there is obviously a, a ladder of degrees, you know, that goes from regional power to continental power to global power and so on. And China is just an emerging power on the global level. So, obviously, the appearance of uh, a new power is a problem for the extant powers. And since we are emerging from uh, uh, 20 years, more or less, two or three decades, where the United States, more or less, were the only dominant power at global level, well, this is a problem. The best solution would be that the United States and China meet midway, yeah, potentially, and the, on Midway Atoll, it would be a great place. Um, uh, shake their hand and say, welcome, thank you, let's try to find a way to get along. Unfortunately, this is, this is probably not going to happen because there are... Uh, yeah, several points of disputes. That's the situation. This is the world like it is, unfortunately. And as I said, it's rather pointless to give an ethical judgment. The, I mean, each one of us will have its own con ethical judgment, obviously. Um, but if you, we want to analyze what is going to happen, want to analyze the scenario, understand what is happening, yeah, we need to leave this aside, unfortunately. So, at the end of the day, Taiwan has more a symbolic value than an actual value because it is perceived uh, to be the last remnant of this century of humiliation. And obviously, this symbolic value is important for the Chinese. Taiwan has, has been doing fine for a very long time. What would happen if it should become a fully-fledged state? Because today is not. Uh, most of the world actually accept that there is only one China, um, and even it also has a particular status within the United Nations. So, yeah, that's a very particular, strange situation. Obviously, if Taiwan pointed to 
and proclaim itself as an independent state, uh, that would probably be unacceptable for uh, mainland China. Um, and mind, there are some political parties within Taiwan that aim exactly to that. And but if this would happen, this would definitely bring to a heightened tension in, in the area. And since the area is so important, the waves will cover the entire world. Another interesting thing is that is the objective 2049, in the sense that the Chinese Communist Party has given to the PLA, the armed force of China, that actually depend on the chain of command that goes through the party, they have given a general strategic objective to become, by 2049, which is the 100th uh, anniversary of the foundation of the uh, Chinese Communist Party, this I said, I was saying, to become, by 2049, a world-level military organization. They didn't define exactly what this means, but if you look at some of the Chinese literature that has been produced in the last two or three decades, this basically means for substantial strategic parity with the United States. This is how they see the thing, given that what we know now. What is the possible scenario that is going to unfold in case of a conflict? The United States is, in, is undoubtedly preparing for a shooting war. In the last two or three years, there have been a lot of war games, some classified, a few uh, more or less public, that have um, sort of played out different scenarios of this conflict with China. I'm sort of perplexed from my point of view, because we keep saying that a shooting war with Russia is just uh, the, the, the first step on the ladder that takes to the nuclear conflagration, but China has nukes too. Two strategic nukes, definitely enough to make a lot of damages, I would say unacceptable damages, to any opponent um, country if the, if the integrity of China would have been menaced. So I think that even thinking of a shooting war with China, the United States and other nuclear power being involved is unthinkable, but let's park this thought for the moment and let's move on, because apparently the planners on both sides believe that a conventional war may happen and may remain conventional for, for some time, and even, even for a protracted period. So let's have a look. So, in the United States, there have been plenty of war games. They are all based on this scenario where the Chinese try to invade Taiwan. And that's the base, that's the core assumption. Some scenario actually include the fact that Chinese may want to strike other bases in the area, other um, stakeholders in the area, the other military concentrations in the area they believe are dangerous. In other cases, they don't do that. But that's the, the, the key, the core tenet is the Chinese invasion of Taiwan, amphibious invasion of Taiwan, with the purpose of reconquering the island. Uh, and by the way, this one that you see here is a very interesting game that could be worth a video on itself because it was a simulation of a scenario where the collaborative combat aircraft has entered service. So these were games, the plans of the Western side, because we don't really know the Chinese plan. We just we just can't get. We just we, all the only thing we can do is guessing. But on the Western side, the idea is how to stop a Chinese invasion. And so the question, I suppose, is can the Chinese pull it off? Um, well, it is uh, difficult potentially possible. There are um, several elements, obviously, that need to be considered in this equation. Please note on this map, which are the current foreign and potential new bases above the US in the area. The US is trying to acquire new positions in, uh, in the area exactly to try to contain the Chinese forces uh, in what is normally called the first island chain, that is the line that goes from Japan uh, through Taiwan to the Philippines, Indonesia and, um, and Singapore. And as I said before, some of the scenarios that are playing in the war games uh, include preemptive strikes in, on some of these uh, bases. In terms of defense spending, which is normally uh, something that needs to be taken with an enormous pinch of salt, there's no comparison, okay? 
China is spending uh, 20 times more, almost 20 times more. So in terms of conventional ballistic missile launches, China has 280 rapidly expanding. These are 2023 beginning, beginning mid 2023 data, um, but they are expanding very rapid, quickly. So uh, China has about 280 ballistic missile launchers of, um, of a range that is relevant. I mean, so I'm not counting uh, artillery systems and so on. And and uh, they are uh, rapidly growing. Taiwan has none. This number is quite interesting because uh, we don't know how many missiles, how many rounds these launchers have, but this is more or less the size of the salvo. Obviously, it never works like that, okay? Uh, things go, always go wrong. Uh, normally, you have to consider that between a quarter or a third of every arsenal is not available for a reason or, or another. Uh, in terms of satellites, sorry, uh, China has 11 communication satellites and 141 ISR satellites that do the most various things, but that's a serious number. The Chinese have a, a serious capability to keep uh, the, the rest of the globe under control. The Taiwanese happen to have launched one satellite for intelligence. The amphibious brigades, which would be uh, important for an attack on Taiwan, are six, but they are actually uh, expanding as well, and Taiwan has two. In China, these are considered to be elite units. There are two air assault brigades, Taiwan has none. Overall, in terms of maneuver brigades, there are about 77 brigades in China. About a third of them are um, heavy units, the others are sort of lighter units. Um, Taiwan has seven maneuver brigade, medium heavy, and 27 light reserve uh, units. In terms of submarine which is an area where China is still not yet, uh, is not expanding as you would expect. Uh, China has six nuclear attack submarines and 46 uh, diesel or uh, electric submarines. China has two carriers, probably expanding, we'll get back to that. And in terms of surface combat unit, China has seven cruisers, 42 uh, DDGs and 41 frigates. These are very quickly expanding. A bit more than a half of these numbers are actually very modern units that are perfectly equivalent to any Western units. Taiwan has four DDGs and 21 frigates that tend to be quite old. In terms of amphibious capabilities, China has 11 between LPDs and LHDs, and this is actually expanding. They're, they're doing some very interesting designs. Taiwan has two that are basically going to be used to um, to connect with the islands in the, in the Taiwan Strait that are actually part of the ROC. There are also other smaller amphibious ships and China has 49, but you also have to consider that probably more than 100 civilian ferries that can be used for, a, for an assault on Taiwan eventually. The number of logistic ships is 153 for China and just 9 for the ROC. Don't be misled by the this number, the number of large units, oceanic units, is relatively small, it's no more than a dozen. Um, but yes, they still have a large logistic capability, either for fuel or supply, transport, repair, and so on. Chinese naval aviation is has 45 bombers, 179 fighters, and I actually um, the plus means that there are actually more, but I left out anything that is not new. New means either a flanker derivative or a, a J10 or J or J20, and just five tankers, which seems a very small number. The, the Republic of Taiwan is just 12 maritime patrol aircraft. Uh, People Republic of China has 176 bomber. Republic of China has none. In terms of fighters, exactly always uh, considering the new ones, China had at the time of the when the military balance 2023 was closed, 1,182 fighters, modern, as I said before. There are probably at least uh, six or 700 previous generation. That effectiveness is dubious, maybe reconnaissance, but that's it. The Republic of Korea has about 390. I'm 
living out, for example, very old aircraft like the F-5s. Electronic warfare, 31 China, 1 Taiwan, ISR 52 China, 7 Taiwan. These include some dedicated reconnaissance fighter or, or aircraft. Airborne early warning, 33 China, 6 Taiwan, that has relatively modern OKIs. 271 transport aircraft for China, 33 for Taiwan. 21 tanker, which is something which where China is actually lacking, and none for the Republic of uh, China, Taiwan. Um, the, some launches, I left out the, the pluses because I left out the medium to short range units. There are about 780 uh, launches between Army and Air Force in, um, launches, sorry, batteries in uh, service in China, and 152 in uh, in the Republic of uh, China. So, as you see, there is, there's no match, okay? China is a gorilla, a 2,000 pound gorilla, and Taiwan is small. In case of invasion, give a defeat for certain, because part of the island facing the mainland has, is relatively flat, and some flatlands on the coast, and a number of beaches that are suitable for the invasion. The mountain of the interior is very rugged, and the the west coast again is rugged as well so it's not suitable for landing so you can envisage a situation in which the chinese may end up establishing bridgeheads expanding bridgeheads they end up destroying the taiwanese air force no one else is actually involved in the conflict they destroy the taiwanese air force they destroy the taiwanese navy or they put in a situation where they can't do really anything and then they conquer the coastal plains with a force that capable of maintaining but then moving into the mountains will become probably complex and if the terrorists don't give up uh, non-conventional warfare guerrilla tactics can actually exact a very a very high price from uh, the Chinese at least potentially so, so if China decided to invade Taiwan it's something that they can do it's not not an easy fit potentially may end up being bogged down in a very long term uh, uh, confrontation uh, that um, is not going to do good to both sides. So if you look at the areas that are expanding the most, well, it, it probably makes sense if you're looking at in the light of an invasion of Taiwan. The, the landing units, the marine units is actually, as I said, it was expanding they are going to be more or less three times the size in the next few years. So yes, that's definitely something you may want to do if you do amphibious operations. They are also, as I was uh, uh, mentioning before, um, producing some very interesting designs for amphibious ships like the Type 75. And I find very interesting this one, the planned, not yet delivered, but it's, it's planned and probably be, be built. Uh, the Type uh, 76, which are, uh, with other than helicopters, it is, go is going to have an electromagnetic catapult for uh, drones, unmanned UCAVs, which is uh, actually very interesting. This becomes a very interesting type of light carrier that has many uses beyond Phoebus Assault. Always in the same perspective of invading Taiwan, they are actually expanding the surface combatant number, which at this point will be necessary to protect the amphibious component. The ballistic anti-ship missiles and uh, the large number of available cruise missiles, either launched by the aircraft or launched by ground, are going to keep the United States fleet at arm's length. They, they are going to impede them to get too close to be able to, to help Taiwan at which the United States is uh, replying with the pools concept, but this is something that we are going to see at a different time. Long-range fetuary missiles are going to create these bubbles of exclusions around the coast uh, and on top of the invasion area, particularly if you can transfer some of these launches in Taiwan, then it becomes very difficult to, for a, an opponent air force to operate. And, um, well, and the Chinese air force will augment and contribute to all 
those missions that we have just laid out it may be necessary to invade Taiwan because it has the capabilities of air to air. Obviously, the jury's still out, and I hope it's not going to to become a settled dispute. But um, the, the Chinese air force has progressed to a point where it is definitely a non-negligible force. So, if this is the case, what the Chinese are doing is focused on preparation of invading Taiwan. May Maybe they won't do it, maybe it will become a, a peaceful uni reunification and blah blah and blah blah. But the military preparation is focused on that. How do you explain these? How do you explain these fours? Liaonin, Shandong, Fujian, Type 004. How do you explain that they are investing in aircraft carriers? So let's come to the carriers. There are two Stobar carriers, Type 001 and 002, derived from the Soviet uh, Kazanetsov uh, design. There is one Type 003, uh, but more likely will be two. Uh, these are Katobar carriers, not much smaller than an American supercarrier. Projected Type 00, Type uh, 004, which is a nuclear carrier, a, more or less the, the, the same size as an American Ford carrier. And, well, and probably there are many more to come. And if the Chinese do everything to, to invade Taiwan, why are they doing such a big investment? That's puzzling, no? Puzzling the fact that the Chinese also have two. One is in Dalian, in the, in the, in the north, in the Yellow Sea, and the other one is, is in Shanghai. And by the way, uh, we have so many pictures of the Fujian carrier because uh, the shipyard is not far from the landing part of the Shanghai International Airport. So a lot of people from the aircraft take pictures of the, of the carrier. No? So, Type 001, the Stover Learning Hall number 16, was built in Dalian in the north. And again in the north, the Type 002, the Shandong, was built. The Fujian, on the contrary, has been built in Shanghai and it is nearing completion. And the, the, the Type 004 is unnamed as yet but it's planned to happen in Dalian. We know that, and we know that the process is starting because in the Dalian area, there are hiring people who actually have experience. And we know that's a nuclear carrier because the name of the project has the same uh, designation as all the other uh, naval projects that involve nuclear energy. Also, we know that tenders for the long lead components, which are the catapults, the arresting gear, propulsion, uh, have already been issued some time ago. It's definitely happening. Uh, in, in the pictures or in the models that are actually available by this Type 004, the hull number is 20. And so since the Fujian is 18, has hull number 18, the gap uh, seems to suggest some analysts believe so, that there's going to be another Type 003 built in Shanghai. Just a few more details about uh, the carrier. So, uh, the, well, the CV-16 Liaoning was commissioned in 2012. It seems, seems yesterday, actually. It is um, very interesting because it, there was the Soviet uh, Baryag hull, that was uh, half built. It was um, laying uh, in abandoned in uh, in a shipyard in Nikolaev in Ukraine, and the Chinese entrepreneur actually purchased the the ship. They towed the ship and all around the world till Dalian, and the ship was completely uh, rebuilt with the help of some Ukrainian designers. The carrier wing is relatively small. I mean, it's a Katobar carrier uh, with only 54,000 tons displacement, and it's not, it's not that big. So there are just 24 Shenyang J-15 plus 14 helicopters. The Shandong is a variant substantially larger improvement on the same design. It is a 65,000 tons unit, so about 10,000 tons higher. It was not commissioned in 2012, it was commissioned in 2016, if uh, this is a mistake. And the carrier wing is 32 J-15, plus the same number of helicopters. The J-15, for those who don't know, is 
or has been originally reverse engineered from the Soviet Su-33. Apparently, the Ukrainians still have a prototype of the aircraft available that they sold it to China, and it was uh, sort of basically reverse engineered. Uh, was introduced in 2013. The units built are 60, but B variant that is going to be built for the Fujian, the Type 003, um, that is compatible with the catapults, is going to be, have a completely uh, overhauled uh, avionics and combat systems. It's a flanker, so everything you can think of a, about a flanker applies to this aircraft. This is a pretty old flanker. I wouldn't say it's obsolete, but it's definitely not. Uh, since it doesn't have have a, a very high thrust to weight ratio from a Stobar carrier. It can carry a lot of payload. It has been seen mostly with air to air weapons, which tend to be somewhat lighter than uh, anti ship or air to ground uh, weapons. And this is basically consistent with the original Kuznetsov design, those carriers were not designed to be used in a, in a, in a carrier group. Their design, their mission, was to be um, capable of carrying a number of fighters dedicated to air defense and eventually a reconnaissance, uh, but with the main Soviet battle groups. But the Soviet battle groups were centered around the Kirov or Slava class crews I mean, the large cruisers with the large surface-to-surface -surface missiles. So the purpose of those carriers was just to provide the air cover. And so that's basically the reason why they were okay in that context. In uh, a context where you expect that the carrier is actually doing uh, uh, more general operation, it is uh, less effective, it still has some capabilities. Actually, having something that flies is better having, than having nothing, definitely not ideal. Couple of things that not everybody knows, some curiosities. Liaoning and Shandong have been classified for years as training ships or, ex according to some sources, experimental ships, just to see if aircraft carriers were a good thing. I mean, the Liaoning has been declared operational just three or four years ago. Being uh, commissioned in 2012, probably took eight years to become operational. The purpose of these two ships, while retaining some military capabilities, was mostly to create the Chinese naval aviation. Apparently, the first consultants that helped the Chinese were the Brazilians that not many of you may know, but they had a carrier till not many years ago. Now, obviously, the more than a decade has passed. So they have built a core of pilots, uh, officers, and uh, crews that are actually expert and know what is the reality of operating a carrier in, 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 in the ocean. I mean, one of the problems that are actually mentioned about the Chinese Navy quite often is that, yeah, they don't have the pedigree, the heritage of the U.S. Navy or other, or the Royal Navy or other Western Navy. Yes, it's true, but with every mission, every time they go out at sea, every time they take off and land, every time they execute their training, that becomes less and less and less and less true. And the Chinese are incredibly good at catching up and burning all the records while they're catching up. They're really, really good at that. One day I will probably study in detail what it is that is actually happened, the type of the details of the internal organization of Chinese project, if there is any source, because I would be very curious how they pull out, uh, uh, pull off to do this kind of very large project in a very short amount of time. True, they have the advantage of being the second movers, even that. Anyway, as I was saying, these carriers, I was, as I was mentioning before, in China are deployed, uh, according to the Western doctrine, as elements of a battle group, and that's the reason why they are less effective, as we were mentioning before. Okay, about the Fujian, the, 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 the ship uh, doesn't have cracks, as I was saying at the beginning. Um, it is... Uh, nearing completion and probably this year we will see the first uh, sea trials. As you can see from this picture we can see the three electromagnetic catapults that are fully visible now. It's as you can see quite a large ship, 80, 80 
thousand tons of displacement. The catapults have been tested with dead weights and well seem to work apparently from what we have seen they, they are capable of shooting these. Um, also interesting has been a mock-up of a J35 has been spotted. These are used for testing the movements of the aircraft on the on the deck and in the hangar. So this is just it's not a true aircraft it's just a model with the same size um, that can be handled in the same way and it is just used for this kind of test but this is a confirmation that the J35 will be part of the air wing of the okay the J35 this is um, I, had, uh, I already made a video on the channel about this aircraft obviously we don't know much it is a naval version of what started as a sort of a private venture a prototype that was called the FC31 is now undergoing tests it is being developed it has already flown it has been developed it's a medium fighter there are not much data even probably even more important than uh, the, uh, the J35 is the Xi'an KJ600, which, as you can see, some, is something that looks a lot like an uh, AC2 Okai, and this is going to to be the naval early warning uh, aircraft for the Type 03. One may say that they actually copied the Okai, uh, but well, it's basically a turboprop. Okay, the, the Chinese already have a um, non negligible fleet of AWACS. That even there are some declaration from the Americans, from the US Navy, that say that they have interesting features. So they don't have a, pro they didn't need to copy an AWACS, they didn't need to copy a light turboprop. It's just a case of form follows function. So it is an enormous program. A lot of resources are in, uh, involved in this. And again, the question is, is it worth it just to attack uh, Taiwan? I mean, Taiwan is just 170 kilometers off the coast of China. I mean, it's not that a carrier has a lot in this context. I mean, the American scenarios, the war games, normally show the Chinese carrier sort of trying to envelop Taiwan and protect Taiwan somehow. But is it really worth it? And uh, thinking about this perplexity um, led me to think about a scenario which is a bit of an apocalypse, something which is, may potentially at the end of the day influence the life of all of us. And um, I hope to be wrong, but I'm going to share this with you now. So, do you remember this? all these bases that pretty much seal the Chinese coast and uh, the South China Sea. This is clear when this will be completed, there will be a lot of places where the US and Allies forces could operate to contain China. And I believe that Chinese planners don't sleep well thinking to this. And also, do you remember this? This, this area, the, the South China Sea, uh, the, the area around the Malacca Strait and the Indian approaches, which are the areas that are needed to be, that China need to be in control of to keep the jugular artery open. With that in mind, let's try, let's make a couple of, let's make a couple of scenarios. So what happens if China attacks Taiwan with the objective of conquering the island? The US will respond because well, they will probably jump on the casus belly to try and inflict a lesson to China. The first thing that they will do is closing the access to Malacca, to the Malacca Stride and trying to strike the bases and the, the traffic in the South China Sea. Obviously, because the same way we can see that there is, uh, that, that route is extremely important, we, they see that as well. So it's, it's not a surprise. This is, is hardly surprising. So what may happen is that the Chinese um, attack Taiwan, they, um, they will be bogged down and uh, in a difficult campaign uh, with part of the island in conquered and another part of the island basically ended up as sort of an Afghanistan in the Western Pacific and they end up being cut off from the import of the commodities that they need to run their economy. 
Sure, for the United States and the Allies won't be a walk in the park. The, those war games I was mentioning before normally show that the losses of the Western side are very, very high, well beyond, way beyond as we have been used to in the, in the past few decades. But at the moment, the United States have the advantage. They have the strategic advantage of uh, controlling the, 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 the first island chain, and they have also the operation the operational and tactical and technological advantage of uh, having superior numbers of a technology that is, uh, if not the same, it's even better than the Chinese technology. I mean, the probably the United States still has a margin in some areas, but it's a margin that is becoming thinner and thinner every year. But still, the United States will probably come out on top of this confrontation. So, I argue, if this is the case, if I can say this, the Americans can say this, the Chinese, which are definitely not stupid, can say this, the only logical conclusion is that China will never attack Taiwan. Because if they can pull it off, the, maybe to some degree, the specific operation, the consequences will be devastating. Capability will be lost and they will be, they will be pushed back to, yeah, in terms of development, they will be pushed back probably decades. Well, what China is going to do? Uh, well, because at some point conquering Taiwan is still an element. No, so something they will do. Well, the first thing that we need to remember is that the objective for the military preparation is 2049. So, quite in the future. They will use this time just to upgrade all their capabilities. They did great in some areas. They will probably close the gap even more in many other areas and in some other areas they're probably ahead. In. And particularly, they uh, it seems that they will create a fleet of catobars from here to 2049. They can probably build five, six, maybe even more. And uh, crucially, crucially, they will be much more experienced than they are now. They will have uh, more than 20 years of operations under the belt. So, again, probably in terms of traditions, the difference with the Royal Navy and the US Navy will still be there. But again, it will become thinner and thinner and thinner. And the other thing that they need to do is to resolve their pending controversies with India because assuring the Indian neutrality and friendship for them is essential. So the current contrast, the current territorial, mainly territorial contrasts that China has with India will be probably be either f become frozen or resolved, and there will be probably a tightening of the relation between the two countries because they are not directly in competition, or at least they're not too much in competition, so they can, um, they can probably find a common ground. I mean, for those who think that India is in the Western camp because it is now part of an alliance with the United States and blah, 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 be rest assured the only interest India is safeguarding is its own interest. India is playing on all tables at the same time. They may be friendly today and enemies tomorrow. Okay, depending what they believe is better for them. Uh, but for China, having a friendly India is definitely strategic. The way they could start the operation was to neutralize the US bases nearby with tactical strikes. Okinawa comes to mind, but also the Japanese bases. Uh, uh, and for those who say that they will never attack bases on the Japanese soil to avoid provoking the Japanese, well, in the Chinese desert, I should have included the picture, actually. In the Chinese desert, there is a target range where the, there is the Yokosuka military base uh, drawn on the desert with the silhouettes of of the ships at anchor just to test the missile precision. So yeah, I think that they will be targeting this kind of bases even in Japan. They will probably attack also the bases in the second island chain. I mean, the island farther from the this this first island chain is close them in with long range strikes. So the bombers, the H6 can get there, but with the cruise missiles can get there, but there's also plenty of ballistic missiles that can, can get there. 
Part of the carrier fleet that have been built will be used in the South China Sea to cooperate with the bases that are already there to go against the Philippines that recently have uh, signed an agreement with the United States to give them some more bases. I mean, those light blue circle points, are, are light blue dots are becoming real bases in, in within, a, within a few years. So they will probably use the, the aircraft carrier force to neutralize these bases. And they will use another part of the carrier force to neutralize uh, Singapore and the bases in the area and probably land on the island, land in Singapore and occupy some ground positions around the, the strait of Malacca and then reinforce it with other forces. And, well, if they manage to do that with a friendly India, then the jugular may remain open even in case of um, prolonged hostilities. If they control Singapore, they can also operate in the Indian Ocean to protect the commercial traffic from the US Navy elements that managed to get there. These are broad strokes. There are a lot of details that we could get into by how it could be uh, could happen, but I mean, that will take hours and hours and hours, and uh, I'm not definitely feeling at the, at the best now. So, if you're American, you're probably thinking this is impossible because in the time that they will catch up, we will also develop, which is true, definitely. But again, it's not a matter of being equal, it's a matter of closing. And the objective is not being global, but is actually being capable of maintaining this pipeline where the oil, mostly, is going to flow toward China. And mind, by 2049, this dependency could also be, could also be easier to do that because the dependency from fossil fuels could be somewhat lower. I was saying this seems impossible, okay? Um, because it's basically saying, uh, well, uh, China, if China can, can't even get Taiwan, it needs to actually neutralize all these positions. Well, I believe that China will wait, eventually even beyond 2049, uh, until they have this capability. I don't think that China will attack before they're ready. And it's not just my assessment. There are indeed some Chinese publications where the Chinese theories say we will not get into a fight with US Navy until we get to a substantial strategic parity. So I don't think that they want to get into a fight now. Even though they want Taiwan back, they don't want to get into a fight now, in the near future. Okay, now parking the fact that it seems impossible. So if they manage to complete these objectives, uh, Taiwan is not in a position of, to defend itself. It will fall just a matter of, it comes a matter of time before it falls. A successful offensive on this scale has also the potential to significantly reduce the, the American potential because the losses of the United States uh, will be high and there will be losses of high technology assets, all these kind of high technology assets that are planning to deploy in the Pacific, which is yeah important. You may expect also that non-conventional operation will happen on the continental United States. Mm, I'm practically sure this is happen. This is going to happen, considering the Chinese doctrine. So, uh, if we get to this stage, it's either a ceasefire uh, with a new world equilibrium or a nuclear exchange. And I hope I am wrong. You may argue, well, that's good. We have plenty of time to defuse the problem. Well, I think there is a de we are in the typical devil's alternative here, uh, because the more the United States waits, the more it becomes difficult to defeat China. Today, the United States enjoy a strategic and military advantage, and that is going to be progressively eroded. That's, that's just a fact. They're catching up. They have all the potential to catch up. So for the United States, it's better to act now than wait. If they wait, deterrence will probably stop working. It's probably working now, surely working now, as I said. They won't act until they are reasonably sure to pull it off, to be successful and being capable of doing this operation. But the more they wait, the more the possibilities become uh, smaller. So what they could do, for example, is to push Taiwan to declare itself an independent state. And if it happens, China, I think that China cannot lose face and will quickly mount an operation. And uh, the invasion turns out to be very difficult and the US-led coalition wins. Paying a hefty price, 
but wins. And well, and then we have the nuclear exchange. So basically, if China wins, there's a good probability that we will get a nuclear exchange. If China loses, there's a good probability that we are going to have a nuclear exchange. And this is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much.